and pictures of my setup on, on Twitter. You know, I had my, uh, my laptop, my speaker, uh, my microphone, and my, my super duper electric uh, mosquito swatter. You know, like like I was ready. <laughs> I was so stoked. And then uh and then I'm like, okay, what happened here? <laughs> yeah, as usual, we just bump into a million technical problems before we can actually get the bandwagon going. Yeah, uh so mosquito squatter, that's uh the situation there in Bali, right? I wow, it's it's yes, yes and no. Like I'm I live, uh, so I got a new villa and uh, my, actually my fiance's villa, we just finished renovating. It's super close to the beach. We're like literally one minute walk from the sand. Uh, the only problem is that uh, this area close to the beach, they have like all these like bushes and trees. And mm -hmm. so it's like really conducive for, for mosquitoes. And, and uh, you know, the, the people who own the land they're not doing anything with it they just it's just mm. overgrown bushes so we we can't you know it's just basically mosquito breeding ground but we can't do anything <laughs> about it's it absolutely it's, terrible my god it's actually getting better now because now we're uh, huh. shifting from the from the rainy season to the dry season so now oh, like okay. the mosquito problem is a lot better because there's less less rain and uh but there was there was uh so i what i try to do you know i try to make sure there's no steel water anywhere near my villa yeah um, the, the, i had a little so i had we had a little uh like a little pond so so i made sure to populate with fish to eat the mosquito mm. larva but oh man there's some mm. cats in the neighborhood like Oh no! <laughs> I know. We, just we one problem to another, and another just because the cycle of life won't give you yes. any slack. <laughs> yes, I mean after like we buy fish for like three, four times, I realized I'm just feeding the cat. You know, <laughs> I'm just like literally just feeding the cat by replenish the pond with with yeah. fish. Um, just because free so food for the kitty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the the cat were super smart because we brought our puppies to stay with us for a few days, and then the, the 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 fish were safe. And then as soon as we took our puppies to walk on the beach, we came back, the fish were gone. So the cats were waiting. They they they, oh they, they were just waiting to pounce on my fish. But um, you know, enough about my uh, trouble in the paradise. <laughs> yes. Sure, why not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, uh, so I'm very glad to finally have you coming back. This is almost after a year since our uh, first episode yeah. of the epic uh, Rome versus Par Parthia battle of Carhai. Oh, oh, by the way, you know, why don't you introduce yourself? I, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being a terrible host here. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have, uh, for, for our audience who have not listened to uh, our epic, epic episode on the epic they battle. Should. They should. They should. They should. Go, they should go back to episode number one. Yes. Go back in time. Uh, go to the Silk and Steel episode number two. That's the, the prelude episode. And then we have, following that, we have the actual battle of Car High. And so we're now doing kind of the trilogy, the, the, the last epilogue right the the the, the aftermath of oh. battle of car high and i thought we were kind of doing like a final fantasy kind of a thing because my chronology is all messed up you know because going from soundcloud that's absolutely true that we're kind of doing this trilogy thing but uh -huh. kind of like going from japan to north america something got messed up with the numbers so on spotify <laughs> we're actually on episode number six i think Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Because yeah, um, because it has to be like chopped I, up. I got something. too excited in between. I think I, I I recorded several other episodes. So so I will list the the prelude episode and the actual battle episode in our show notes on the Patreon uh, on my Patreon page, and so people can click through and listen to the ones that you, if you haven't listened to it yet, uh, because it's excellent. And um, something you probably never heard before, you know, it's, this is really the, the battle was told from, you know, from the other perspective. 
right? Because we we normally get um, these uh, perspective on kind of the the Rome versus the Orient, right? <laughs> everything yeah. is told from the Roman perspective. We so, totally corrected that now. We just yeah. flipped tables completely. So now we got the correct perspective, according to me, of course. Yes, uh, we set yeah. the record straight. Yes, and now Absolutely. we um. Actually, why don't you? Actually, I, I still haven't introduced you. I'm sorry, Amir. So <laughs> no, don't worry about introduce it. Introduce yourself to my audience. But like, what do you do? You know, you you are involved with um, Iran History Forum, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm the uh, administrator of the upcoming uh, web page, web portal, web forum, what have you, of Iran History Forum. Um, it's an upcoming web page where we're going to be. Uh, making a community for Iranian studies all the way from prehistory to modern history. Uh, it's a forum in English and in the Persian language and uh, kind of excited to launch this thing, thing pretty soon actually. So yeah, yeah well I'm it's been bored. years in the making so don't hold me on to it. <laughs> <laughs> might actually be well, delayed for a bit longer, you know. Procrastination these times in Corona times, it's like yes. it's like the norm these days, you know, because yes. everyone is just waiting for the next event to come. But anyway, it's uh, an upcoming forum, and I'm really excited to be launching this thing soon slash finally. <laughs> I I, uh, I can't wait. And 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 but before you, you know, like you actually been involved for years, also. On another project, right on the on the kind of the reenact medieval reenactment. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I'm also part of the uh, reenactment uh, group known as Eran Uturan. Uh, you had Nadim on the show a couple of times, I think, yeah. on Silk and Steel yeah. podcast. Uh, great guy. We do uh, a lot of Sogdian era reenactment where we recreate the costumes. We throw these magnificent banquets, making historical foods. Where we also hold events in museums and in open air events. Um, you had some and, tight, tight Sogdian uh, 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 costumes. I mean, like I, I saw pictures posted by Nadim, and, and it's uh, I can, can I get some of the pictures? Actually, I want to post it for our patrons on the. Yeah, the sure pizza. thing. I I, yes. I don't think anyone actually minds. I think we actually would would really appreciate the free publicity. So just. Post away. <laughs> yes, and then finally put a face to to your amazing voice and to the, oh, the narrator. Oh, you're such a flatterer, Carl. Oh my god, you're gonna make <laughs> me blush. That's that's my that's my my gig. That's how I get my guests to come on. So, um, without further ado, let's let's delve into this history. Can you actually mm. uh, give a little background refresher for for people who maybe sure just thing. want the Cliff Notes version? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think a, a recap is definitely in order because in the previous episodes, we kind of really went into the uh, detail as to what the background was, the whole geopolitical setup you know, before, during and after the Battle of Karai. And I don't, I don't think we actually um, left a detail untouched. We, we actually also went into certain scenarios. Yeah. But uh, we outlined all this because it's kind of crucial for our understanding of the setting and just why this is so important, you know, because I really feel that it has been a deliberately underrated battle when, in fact, it's actually one of the biggest deals in all of human martial history, actually. So he basically set the template for the next uh, couple hundred years of interaction of yes, like uh, Roman Empire versus you know the 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 Iran based empire, right? I mean, whether yeah. it's Parthia or Sasanian, I mean, it, it it like pre prior to this, Rome was on this kind of unstoppable expansion, and and it it's it seems that you know Rome would just roll over everything in its path, and this mm -hmm. battle of Carhai really put a stop to that. So so really, it's a it's a, a like. A, a titanic shift right uh, uh, uh but you will tell us you yeah know, what... yeah i mean yes. just as you said really i mean rome at the time was at the height of its power now of course rome had a number of 
apexes, you know, when, when they would be peaking, you know. Uh, but it is kind of fair to say that at this time, you know, before the battle, the the Romans had been on, on sort of an unprecedented expansion, both in terms of territorial expansion, but also in terms of how their influence expanded in the in the well, in the ecumen, in the in the known world, uh, and nothing was truer of this than in the East. Now, conventionally, we put the East sort of where Asia Minor begins and then eastwards, but this is also where the Roman expansion is is at the most tangible. You know, this is where we start to see this uh, network of client states and. Uh, vassal kingdoms that I mentioned earlier in the previous episodes. So we have in Rome this kind of arrangement. It's popularly known as the triumvirate. Actually, as we also outlined previously, it was more closer to a duumvirate, you know, between two established figures, Marcus Licinius Crassus and uh, Pompey. Uh, and a rising star at the time who was uh, conducting a military campaign in Gaul in today's France, being Julius Caesar. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that the expansion up to this point was unstoppable. Now, in contrast, the Parthian Empire, through which we have attempted to prism this whole conversation, had, on the other hand, been mired in some civil strife following decades of stagnation, and, um, and the stagnation had also been the result of a succession crisis. Now, in the Parthian study circle, this is also known as the Parthian Dark Ages, where we don't really know a terrible lot of what's happened, except for what we can sort of uh, interpret through coinage that have survived to us to this day. Now, it's important to understand that this civil strife at some point had invited in the Romans as a party. Now, initially, they had been so as arbitrators and as supporters of a claimant that had promised certain benefits to the Romans. But as those plans kind of were scuttled, they later uh, transformed into bona fide uh, aggressors, as we would later see when one of the claimants was killed and the throne had been restored to Orodus II. Now, notwithstanding that Crassus had been waging a quote-unquote a private war, there had been no significant opposition against this sort of enterprise at home. Uh, Previously, we also established that Plutarch had injected this sort of oppositional sentiment to this war as sort of a force majeure uh, to kind of condemn Crassus for losing the battle. You know, these different little omens that we see prior to the actual battle itself. Anyway, it is fair to say that the situation for the Parthians had looked dire and that as we had previously established, initially Crassus campaign was something of an overwhelming success. Now, we then established that extraordinary, uh, extraordinary uh, situations also call for extraordinary men who otherwise also devise extraordinary solutions. So then we also introduced Serena's into the fray, you know, and his quite cleverly devised anti-Roman army. We outlined the uh, nuts and bolts of this in previous episodes and explored in detail why the battle had a rather predictable outcome. And we also established that this was not because Crassus' rather typical Roman army was somehow performing poorly, but because Serena's army, on the contrary, had performed excellently. Rather, it had performed up to the expectation that this was a mobile anti-Roman army with several force multipliers in place, like logistical uh, and tactical resupplying at the battle itself. 
Now, we dealt with that, of course, but after the battle itself, we also established that the political tides in the wider region had completely changed. Now, what do we mean by the region? Well, we refer to Asia Minor, the Caucasus, the Levant, and in Mesopotamia, because as we mentioned previously, the Romans had sort of established this network of client states, which had uh, been part of its strength in the East. But now with the battle and the outcome and the situation in Roman Syria, the momentum had now shifted 180 degrees. Now, as we uh, established this, we, we had also uh, established that there also were certain myths that were prevalent in the retelling of this battle. Uh, we had established that the Armenian route was not viable at any point in the conflict, not only because it was logistically unviable, but it was also because there were no real reinforcements to speak of. And this is was something that was also confirmed in the text by the fact that there, there had been a speedy political arrangement between the Parthian and Armenian kings, and that the matter had actually been settled uh, through marriage uh, between the uh, sister of the Armenian king and the uh, crown prince of the Parthian king. Now, we also took some time to debunk certain alternative historical scenarios, or what have you, you know, like swapping out Crassus for Pompey or Caesar, in the same battle, we kind of established that this doesn't really do a terrible lot and that this was largely something of an allergic reactionary fanboyism rooted in some kind of a contrived myth that non-Westerners in this type of history are really only obliged to lose. So after this battle, uh, Armenia had promptly returned to the Parthian orbit or the sphere of influence. And this had now been a political reality that would come to define the political relations for centuries to come and signal the most significant Arsacid uh, dynastic inroads into this region, into the kingdoms of the Caucasus region. Uh, before the establishment of the uh, cadet dynasties there in places like in Armenia, in Caucasian Albania, and in Caucasian Iberia. And these would be today's former Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan and uh, of uh, Georgia. Now, the Parthians weren't only then there to stay. They would actually come to rule these kingdoms themselves eventually. And... Armenia, just to really frame this uh, conversation in a geographic manner, uh, was, a long, was, was this landlocked montane kingdom that always sort of made greater sense as a buffer for Iranian imperial interests uh, than it ever did for uh, Roman imperial interests. And to sort of illustrate why this is the case, uh, we can sort of see this on a map that Armenia always stood a little bit more to gain as a gateway between Asia Minor and the Iranian plateau as a land uh, as, as a land bridge rather than as a land extension that had been adjacent to Roman Syria through the Mediterranean. So this was also uh, partially the result of Armenian royal worldview. Uh, because they do, after all, come from the post achaemenid tradition uh, and simply saying that we're simply a, a kingdom of the East, or as the Achaemenids would have called it, the Hashacha. So it is, it is interesting to see that we also see this clash between the uh, Mediterranean thalassocracy, where they would use the Mediterranean as this great imperial canvas, as opposed to this Eurasian uh, this Eurasianistic land bridge uh, uh, worldview. So this is also why we see this conflict uh, so often erupt uh, over Armenia, per se. 
uh, when it comes to the conflicts between the Romans and the uh, and the Iranian powers. So we can see another that it is. Another thing to note, uh, sorry to interject. Uh, another thing to know for uh, for our audience is that if you look on the map. You know the the region of Armenia and the the, the region of Greater Armenia um, is very mountainous, and it's it's basically um, it, it acts kind as kind of geographic barrier uh, as well for to shield uh, the mm -hmm. Iranian plateau from the north. You know from from the threat from beyond the Caucasus, you know, so we, mm. we will see later when the steppe nomads, uh, you know, they would have to cross uh, the land of Caucasus to reach Iran. Um, mm. So, so for, from the from the Iranian based empire perspective, uh, the land of Armenia is kind of a um, very important barrier uh, to have mm. to, 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 to garrison basically, to, to safeguard the, the mm. interest of, 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 of Iran, right? Absolutely. It, it kind of looks like this big castle, uh, if, if you have it, just uh, right between the Iranian plateau and the Caucasus Mountains. So this is like the best wall that you can possibly invest in. Of course, it has a number of weaknesses, as with all strongholds, but it would have been valuable for imperial Iranian interests to hold the Caucasus as a great buffer against these invasions. More so, as you mentioned, for uh, against the nomadic invasions than as a barrier to any emerging Western power across the Mediterranean. Uh, anyway, just to really uh, enumerate uh, the, um, the domino effect so to speak. Uh, we see uh, a similar um, event taking place in Osroene, which is a, um, a small kingdom on the eastern side of the Euphrates River Valley. Uh, the king of Osroene, Abgar, had immediately returned to the Parthian fold after the conclusion of the Battle of Karai, and also, as we established previously on a tangential basis, the alternative account by Cassius Dio, the Osiranians were actually plainly uh, accomplices to the Parthians and had even participated in the battle against the uh, Romans. Regardless, the Osiranians uh, returned to the Parthian sphere of influence, and it was simply one of the many uh, falling domino pieces of many to come in the region. Now, other client kingdoms were also kind of nervously observing the situation unfolding at hand because the Roman position in the region had somehow been critically injured. Um, and they were uh, only keeping a somewhat significant but battered force in Syria. This had been the remnants of the uh, survivors of the Battle of Karai that had just been pinned into place in Antioch, and they had been sort of led by incredibly dubious leadership under uh, Cassius uh, Longinus, uh, one of the commanders of the Battle of Cari. This is, of course, one of the uh, later conspirators behind the murder of uh, Julius Caesar. Uh, so it's actually kind of important to have this in mind that even though there have been Roman forces still left in Syria, the leadership itself was probably not authorized to lead them, so to speak, at least not as a governor. So anyway, in the uh, northern part of this wider region in Cappadocia, in uh, east central Turkey, they have also got a new king. Uh, Ario Barzanus III, curiously self-titled Philo Romaios from his coinage. Now, this means literally friend of the Romans. Uh, and as we all know, when there's a new king on the throne, it's, it's not exactly a secure position to be in for a new monarch. Also, not in a position to provide any assistance to the Romans. Uh, Notwithstanding this very superficial proclamation of uh, friendship to the Romans, which 
would later on turn quite ironic given his own fate. He, he would come to be killed by the Romans. Uh, but as we can see that these uh, sort of self-titulations were sort of reflective of the uh, era, this era of insecurity, because we now see sort of shifting tides uh, taking place. Now, later events would also come to prove that the kingdom of Cappadocia was largely defenseless and kind of up for grabs, and its kings increasingly would come to be treated as disposable puppets. Now, a little bit to the south of Cappadocia, we see an even smaller kingdom, Comagene, uh, another uh, post achaemenid uh, kingdom on the uh, southwestern periphery of greater Armenia and northern Syria. Now, this was also a largely defenseless small kingdom, nominally a Roman ally, but otherwise quite impotent if the Parthians decided to walk over it, which they indeed would do uh, just a tiny bit later on. So any arrangement that this kingdom had with Rome was largely for its own protection. Now, if we go further south into the southern part of Syria, into Judea, again, Judea would prove to be restive and indeed would come to revolt again against the Romans after the Battle of Cari. And this, of course, added to Roman woes because at this point, they couldn't really do anything about it. So, just to put some spotlight on Cassius, the second in command at the Roman disaster of Cari, He's in the middle of all this. He's holed up in Antioch and actually fixed in position because he doesn't really have any, any troops to dispense with. And for the time being, his, his, his real goal is trying to consolidate what's left of Roman Syria and to prepare for an inevitable Parthian invasion. Uh, and the thing is, during this time, he's not really authorized to uh, hold any position as a governor of Syria. Nevertheless, he would eventually prove to be quite a capable commander in his own right. Now, Roman Syria itself, only a few years prior, had been a seat of the Seleucid kings. So this is also a restive location, so to speak. It had only been, quote-unquote, Roman for 10 years after the dissolution of the Seleucid Kingdom, and only three years after the last remaining Seleucid King, Philip II, had been killed, and therefore ending the institution of the crown of Syria itself. Now, Syria had not naturalized as a Roman province, so... Cassius' options, even there, are quite limited. He did not have authority from Rome, again, to rule Syria as a governor. In fact, Roman Syria, up until that point, had only known two governors. Uh, one, which we uh, dealt with previously, Aulus Gabinius, who likely ended this institution of the Syrian crown after the murder of Philip II, and then the ill-fated Marcus Licinius Crassus. Afterwards, this duty would formally uh, fall upon Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus in 51 to 50 BC, uh, and this person would later become a figurehead during the uh, Parthian invasion of Syria under the uh, commander Ornodapatas. Now, in Roman Cilicia, a proper Roman province uh, adjacent to Roman Syria is also defenseless and the tasked with the defense of the highly strategic Cilician gates. Uh, the Cilician gates were a uh, key pass into Asia Minor from upper Syria. And it goes to, goes to show that if, if Syria falls, so would, therefore, the rest of the Roman East. Uh, because the Cilician Gates, I mean, it kind of works like this big funnel. Once you're actually past it, you have all Asia Minor in front of you, which to a horse, 
based army or a cavalry based army just basically means they're going to be everywhere. They're just going to scatter around like birds. So in the well, people middle... who are not familiar with this part of mm -hmm. geography, it's uh, it will be the present day uh, South East Turkey, um, just yeah. just a little bit above Syria. Uh, and, and, you know, this, this uh, Lycian gates and the land of Cilicia, in fact, would become contested uh, between the Arab Caliphate and the East Roman Empire. Because, Indeed. you know, like you said, the, the, the Arab raiders would just, uh, you know, annually, in fact, ride up from Syria and, and there they go. They go to Cilicia, their horsemen, and, and there's not much the Romans could do about it. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Cilicia is kind of defined by a plain in the south where you have the cities of Anazarbos and where you have uh, Tarsus and the like. So it's, so it's wealthy on its own. And, it, and it's actually an economically vibrant region. But the Cilician Gates, uh, which is a little bit further to the northwest, uh, functions as this kind of a gateway into the rest of the Anatolian plateau. And once you're, once you're actually there, you know, there isn't a terrible lot that you can do to stop an invading army. So the Cilician gates is, is, is actually quite crucial for any Western power to hold uh, actual territory of Asia Minor, so to speak. So, um, we see, we see that this, this is actually a little bit problematic for the Romans because in the middle of all this, Syria is actually the linchpin for, for all of this. With Syria weakened, the Romans can only really dispense with the resources in a, in a sort of a conservative manner. You know, they, they can't really dispense with troops everywhere. So we also see that this big network is, is also sort of getting corroded. You know, it's 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 kind of bursting open at the seams. Now, in the middle of all of this, Julius Caesar, if we just shift the attention all the way to the Roman far west, uh, he's facing trouble in in Gaul. Uh, simultaneously, we we see the um, we see the woes add up eventually into the Battle of Gergovia at 52 BC, where the Gauls would score a, a victory. Now, the Gauls would fail to follow up on it, but as a whole, 53 to 52 BC is not really a good year for the Romans. It really ends up being quite crappy for them. So with Crassus gone, this, this triumvirate, this whole political arrangement between the uh, three great Roman figures is, is, is kind of dead. You know, it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of a destroyed project at this point. Crassus was also incidentally Caesar's ally. As I mentioned before, this has actually been more of a duumvirate with one rising star being the uh, third party. Now, with Crassus gone, we would now see a power vacuum emerging. And soon, just as Crassus and Pompey had previously fought one and uh, another, a conflict between Caesar and Pompey now looked increasingly inevitable. Now, we see also in the midst of this that significant turmoil inside Rome itself with gang wars culminating into the destruction of the Roman Senate building itself. This is actually quite an ominous sign, you know, because if, if we uh, often say that the Roman Republic died with Julius Caesar, this has, has, had actually been something of the, um, of the premonition to that. Now, Pompey, at this point, really emerges as the strongest figure now that Crassus has been eliminated. Pompey would opportunistically, but predictably, rise to this occasion. And this would also set the tone for further deteriorating relations with Julius Caesar. Now, in the whole of this, the Parthian situation kind of looks good now. But as we previously detailed, it is completely ruined by the murder of Serenus, who had produced this otherwise massively beneficial outcome. So the Parthian 
the Parthians are actually somewhere in the in this this whole conundrum. What are we going to do from here? You know, I mean, the uh, the pathway to Syria is open, but there has been a great elimination of, of a very prominent figure at the same time. Something something has to be something is is going on. You know, in the backstage, probably a lot of political squabbles because the Parthian number two, basically the second most powerful man in the Parthian Empire, had just been eliminated. How? What? What actually takes place here? And unfortunately, we don't quite know, but we can sort of guess because it would take about eighteen months of dithering and feet dragging before the Parthian Empire would assemble an army to invade Roman Syria, whereupon we can sort of speculate what has taken place in these 18 months. Now, this enterprise of invading Roman Syria was sabotaged probably intentionally from the start for the sake of preserving Orodas' crown by appointing his teenager son, Pacorus, to lead this army. So we see also in the midst of all of this, this, this big upheaval and this, this big regional upheaval that in Asia Minor, we see this resurgent Pontic political power merging again with the rise of Pharnacus II, a Pontic exile from the Cimmerian Bosphorus, attacking this newly Romanized Pontus and indeed achieving a victory against the Romans in 47 BC against Gnaeus Domitius Calvinus. Now, this is all a sideshow, but it kind of illustrates how fundamental this shaking up of the Roman East had truly been due to this outcome at the Battle of Cari. Uh, and at the same time, we also see with the kingdom of the uh, the uh, Celtic Galatians under King Deiotarus, who had otherwise been the most dependable ally of the Romans in the region, would also come to side with Pompey under, during this ensuing Roman civil war. Now, of course, we know what happens because Pompey would later lose this contest against Julius Caesar. So his own power. The Utara's power is also significantly weakened in the region as this uh, central Roman ally in Asia Minor. And this, of course, also paved way for this said brief but vigorous Pontic resurgence. So we also see that in this Pontic resurgence that the region of cultures in today's Georgia uh, and Pontus itself, Roman Pontus, with the key city of Amisos, as well as this kingdom of Cappadocia. We mentioned that it was at this point in a weak state. Uh, uh, lesser Armenia and also Bithynia would be uh, taken at the expense of the aforementioned Bithynians and Cappadocians and Galatians. Uh, and these had all been clients of Rome. So again, Syria was the linchpin that held together this Roman East. And with Syria critically weakened, the Romans really can't do a whole lot to protect their relations in this region. And this would also further alienate their allies for the duration of this chapter. So no it, way the Romans got really lucky because after mm. suffering this catastrophic defeat at the Battle of Carhai, where um, yeah. not only their momentum to expand east was was stopped, but they they were actually in a very 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 vulnerable position in the mm. east. Uh, it's just that their luck that the the Parthians sabotaged themselves <laughs> by yeah. removing. You know, the, the most uh, responsible general Serenas who were responsible for the stunning victory. And then so you have, you know, the Rome engaged in civil wars between, you know, Caesar and Pompey. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then, you know, the Parthia is kind of muddling through with its own, you know, court factional struggles with the death yeah. of Serenas, with the, with the king basically trying to salvage his own prestige and... Yeah. and preserving his own crown so so right now it's it's uh all this land that was kind of 
up for grabs are now kind of you know kind of left to their own devices so to speak that's why you have yeah. these local potentates uh you know trying to assert themselves like this pontic resurgence and Indeed. and uh and and this, so basically rome got this reprieve that they get this time to settle the civil war among themselves yeah. so they can kind of reassert themselves again it's it's really a lucky stroke because with this context raging in this previously Roman, because at this point it's not really Roman anymore, you know, it's it's sort of hanging in the balance. It's kind of it's kind of amusing to think that they really came out of this with such fortune, you know, because really the uh, the uh, key reason why they did was really this this eighteen months of Parthian dragging a feet. Basically, they they had really uh, they had really dithered for for eighteen months. Eighteen months is, is is a really long time to be squandering away with with such with such a window of opportunity. Because Roman Syria had basically been up for grabs at this point. But that's history, you know. And it would take uh, the Romans about a few decades and uh, to come up with this grand peace settlement between Emperor Augustus and King of Kings Fratus IV of the Parthian Empire to recover from the immediate and long-term aftershocks of the Battle of Karai to sort of establish this lasting uh, detente along the Euphrates River. So Rome had to basically transform its whole political machine to achieve this settlement. Uh, Karai had sort of been the spark that had upended this triumvirate experiment of the Roman Republic, and it's 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 kind of it's kind of uh, important to point out that even though the Battle of Karai had been this war-winning uh, battle, this, this great victory that had actually um, stopped a Roman invasion, it's also important to remember that. It it didn't actually end anything. It had actually uh, it had actually prolonged the conflict uh, to such a degree that it would require this grand peace settlement decades on. But I mean, you can I, imagine uh, the confusion of those eighteen uh, months when various local powers are trying to figure out what to do <laughs> when you know suddenly the yeah. two superpowers are yeah, kind of I'm, I'm... paralyzed themselves and now you know before the the all the all the kingdoms in the middle they're very astute mm. uh observers of the geopolitics and they can sense which yeah. way, way the wind blows and they just go for the winners but now it's confu utter confusion you know it's, like it's completely confusing you know because you would imagine that almost immediately afterwards, you would expect the Parthians to be doing something. You know, I mean, these little tiny vassal kingdoms, they're just observing this and they're they're wondering, when is it going to come? When is it going, going to come? You know, and we can also see this sentiment in the letters of Cicero, where he is sort of almost anxiously awaiting this, this great... Parthian invasion that sort of never comes, never comes, never comes, you know, it's kind of unsettling, you know, and to be one of these tiny vassal kingdoms who were just eagerly sort of anxiously waiting what's going to happen, you know, and then it takes 18 months and it ends up in a total fiasco, you know, it's just, it's just completely underwhelming at, at that point, you know, so a lot of these, these vassal kingdoms would eventually begin to slowly swerve back into the Roman orbit. But there was a time when, when all this was sort of hanging in the balance. You know, it had, it had created this, this great earthquake, this political earthquake in the Roman East. But I was uh, thinking that we might actually be moving on to something completely different, Carl. Yes. Roman lost time. China. <laughs> yes. Yes, this is one of the last unresolved questions of you know the consequences of battle car high much much further east and and it's much 
talk about and debate it and, 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 you know, movies were made about it. You know, like I, I think there was a, there was a recent, uh, several years ago, there was a Jackie Chan movie, you know, made about basically the Romans coming to China, you know, like, and it's based on this legend. This is like a, a long persistent myth. And, and today we're going to finally yeah. provide the most definite answer. You know, we're going we're gonna to peel away the myth and give people the real story. Yeah, because it is, it is a myth. I mean, I really don't understand why people still kind of debate this because it's, it's not rooted in any reality. Uh, I mean, I think people kind of have this fascination with this uh, with with this topic because it's kind of it's kind of tantalizing, you know. It's yeah, it it, it really gives ground for all all kinds of fascinations, you know, which we can probably trace to some Marco Polo esque yes. in, in the end of the day, you know. But you know, and you have a lot of you know arm armchair generals, uh, uh, you know, postulating. What would happen if a Roman legions meets a Han China, right? Who would win, you know, the Roman versus the Han China? Because th these are like the two uh, great empires at the either end of the Eurasian continent, you know, like, like, yeah. like people dream about this, 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 this kind of hypothetical matchup. And, and this, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so let's talk about how did we even get, get to the topic? How did we get here? I mean, it's kind of it's kind of bizarre to think about, but they they have been subject. I mean, these these lost legions they they have been subject to all kinds of speculation because I think it's sort of a, this coping mechanism to offset the fact that the reality was probably a whole lot more dreary. I mean, living out their lives as as prisoners of war, redeployed to serve in some outposts in the Parthian northeast. You know, uh, uh, just just to really recap who who these prisoners of war were, you know, we we do know that they would have no, nominally numbered at around ten thousand Roman captives from the Battle of Carai. Probably they were even less. I mean, likely they were even less uh, than ten thousand. And we know first that they were paraded in Serena's uh, mock triumph in Seleucia. And that they next were made to march along the uh, Khorasan Road, uh, or the portion of this mythical Silk Road uh, that uh, ran along the uh, Iranian plateau as a highway, running approximately from modern-day Baghdad to uh, Kashgar in uh, western, uh, in modern-day western China. Uh, now we we have a sort of a good idea of its stopping points due to the lucid itinerary of uh, of Isidore of uh, Carax, later built upon by future uh, chroniclers who compiled uh, similar itineraries. Now, the end destination of these prisoners of war is in Marv, in uh, Margiania. This would be in today's uh, modern day, uh, Uz uh, no, uh, in Turkmenistan. Sorry, I was about to say Uzbekistan. It's actually on the uh, border with uh, Turkmenistan, between uh, Turkmenistan and Iran. Plutarch mentions this Margiania a fair couple of times in his text as a source for the famous armaments of the Parthian cavalry and the steel that had been used uh, to make the uh, to make the armor and the helmets of the cavalry. It is a large and prosperous city at the southwestern edge of Central Asia that at one point during Middle Ages occupies the title as one of the greatest and most populous cities at the time. Now, there is, of course, a caveat to all of this. We, we don't know if all 10,000 of the Roman prisoners of war were destined to go there or if uh, some were assigned to other places across the length of the road. But it would have been a wise policy not to concentrate all the Romans to one location. And we sort of get a few suggestions to this a little bit later on. But just to focus on the city of Marv itself, uh, it had been subject to praise by 
all sorts of contemporary cartographers as a large, well-watered and affluent and well-stocked city with all sorts of luxurious goods and having what a later chronicler from the Middle Ages would call a salubrious climate. So I guess that's nice. I mean, at least the weather is good for the prisoners of war. Yeah, and uh, one thing I'd like to point out, uh, the city of Merv is kind of for centuries, um, maybe even millennium, serve as kind of the frontier of like the Persh, the Iran-based empire, you know, facing the Central Asia. That's yeah. that's kind of like the 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 the, the where the, the border between the, the Central Asia and and the you know the the, the Iran based empires began. You know, mm. beyond beyond are these are kind of um uh land that sometimes maybe the vassals of Iranian base Iran based empire, sometimes vassals of you know step based empire. It's it's yeah. kind of the the contested yeah. zone, right? But Marv is kind of definitely a more uh, a, a, a a city that's controlled and very much influenced by uh, the 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 Iran based empires, right? Kind of like yeah. the frontier, gray frontier city. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of at the meeting point between that end of the Iranian plateau and with the rest of Central Asia. Uh, and, and it kind of makes sense to send, mm -hmm. say, Roman prisoners of war over there because that's the point where there could be po furthest possibly away from the mm -hmm. Roman Parthia frontier, right? And then <laughs> where they could be causing trouble. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and this is where they can actually be used uh, possibly to garrison a, a place against yeah. the, you know, the people that these Romans have no ties with. Yeah, uh, I'm going to be a, just a tiny bit of a spoiler alert here for the listeners. Uh, the Roman prisoners are basically stationed there for basically the, the rest of their lives. So it's not a terrible lot of exciting stuff that happens. But by the time Augustus made his peace terms, which according to some uh, to some uh, um, sources at the time included the return of some prisoners of war, most of the original prisoners of war from the Battle of Cari would have been likely too old to return to Rome if they, if they were even alive at that point. And we're not even sure that the prisoners of relevance were part of Crassus legions or that they were part of the Syrian forces of Bibulus during Ornoda Pata's invasion or if they were part of the legions of the slain Roman governor of Syria, Decidius Saxa, from 40 BC, or that of Marcus Antonius' uh, disastrous invasion of the Parthian Caucasus region in 36 BC. So this lack of detail is actually a crucial indicator for why there were likely no returning Roman prisoners of war. Uh, exciting, right? Let's, let's end this episode right now. What do you say, Carl? Okay, no, <laughs> no, we must, the show must go on. We have to uh, get course. Romans in China, Amir. Uh, of course, of course, jokes aside. So Romans in China, why? And, 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 and who are we to blame for this? So this whole, this whole thing really begins with the uh, sinologist Homer Dubs from Oxford University. He is the man, the myth, and uh, well, that sounds pretty much right. You know, at, at, at the heart of this myth is, is really the Battle of Gigi in 36 BC. I'm completely aware of it. I'm probably mangling up the pronunciation of this. So many apologies to uh, the uh, Chinese-speaking uh, audiences of this show. It, it's fine. Uh, it's actually, um, I mean, in modern Mandarin, it's pronounced zi zi, but the oh, problem oh is... Uh, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, I probably <laughs> won't be able to replicate <laughs> But the problem is that, uh, you know, we are basically using modern Mandarin to pronounce Chinese character that might, that probably was pronounced way different back in like 200 BC or, I mean, because, because the, the Chinese language itself have evolved over the last 2000 mm -hmm. years. And yeah. 
and 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 what make it worth worse is these these words are not Chinese or originally in Chinese language. They are no. they are foreign words that the you know the, they they pick up the Chinese character that have the same song to kind of transliterate these foreign yeah. song uh, yeah. names. And then, but but that that pronunciation was in Middle Chinese, which is. Mm. Totally different from you know modern Mandarin today. So so don't mad. So in, in uh, other words, don't worry about pronunciation. Orthography is always super interesting. No, uh, yeah, nobody is gonna. Nobody. There's. We don't. I doubt there's anybody fluent in Middle Chinese that's gonna challenge your your correct pronunciation. So go for it. Well, that's very thankful. Uh, it's a kind of important to remember also that this battle is actually not named after a particular location, but after the uh, Chongnu uh, warlord who led this army against the uh, Chinese. So uh, this would have presumably located nearby Taraz, uh, to the northeast of the river Jaksartis, or in Syd Dadarya in today's uh, Kazakhstan. So uh, principally the combatants are really just this alliance between the Chongnu and the Kangju against the uh, Han Chinese Empire. And this alliance was largely made up of cavalry, which when you really think about it, when the battle itself um, largely involves cavalry of, of this type, you know, in, in the middle of this uh, big step out there in, in uh, the cent Central Asia, at, the, at this point, you, you kind of have to go back and think, what would Roman legions be doing there? But nevertheless, I'm kind of... That's, like that's a great question because, yeah. you know, Xiongnu, uh, or that's in the modern, modern Mandarin pronunciation, back yeah. in the days, he's probably pronounced something like Honnu because, mm. uh, the, the, you know, the Sanskrit, according to the Sanskrit transcription, uh, they're called Huna, right? Mm. So, so um, you know, the... the the, 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 I'll just call them Honnu, and the Honnu people they're a step nomad, right? And they're they're famous for being horse archers, and 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 you just didn't, you know. I was actually surprised to uh, to know the presence of infantry because you know the Honnu are they're, they are mostly most of their army composed of horse mounted archers, right? Mm. And 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 the. But this this battle is interesting because um, uh, the 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 uh, um, uh, the leader of Hongnu of mm. from which the battle is named Zizi uh, Zizi Yu, he uh, moved his force out of Mongolia to this mm. uh, you know the modern day uh, area between border between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, kind of he tried to find you know, found his own empire and he whole ordered um, construction of a city by the river Talas. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a, a, another note on Talas is that this this river Talas is kind of like the battleground throughout centuries. I mean, like much yeah. later in the 8th century, in 751, there will be a battle fought here. Uh, on the bank of Talas River between the forces of Tang Empire and the battle uh, and forces of the Caliphate, yeah. uh, right? So, so this is kind of the always the, the, the fault line, right? Kind of so to speak. Indeed. And Indeed. And, uh, and 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 then the the yes, it's very interesting. Like the 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 the, the, the infantry couldn't even be the like. The, the main show, right? I mean, it's it's no. quite an auxiliary force or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were uh, the. I mean, they they were just a token force holed up in a fortress nearby Taras. Uh, it's it's quite logical because the sequence of the battle eventually concludes in a something of a siege, you know. Uh, but this 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 was the infantry of the Kangju. This is where we now start to. Uh, delve into who these mythical legions were. They were in the employ of the Kangju. Uh, and they, uh, they are described to employ something of a fish scale formation. And this was for, a, for some time thought of as, as an interesting detail. For the life of me, I don't know why. But some, 
uh, theorized that this fish scale formation was the uh, the famous Roman testudo. And in the previous episodes, I kind of went into detail that in this Republican era, the shields were not the same as the later imperial style shields where, where the testudo was a mainstay. This was still something of a, of a semi-oval, uh, a semi-oval rounded rectangle sort of uh, affair. You know, so it's not what we would traditionally associate with a, a testudo formation anyway, just if, if we for play people, with this. Hmm. For people, for our audience who, you know, may not be Roman history buff, can you just briefly hmm. go over what is testudo? Yeah, so the testudo formation is kind of like this elaborate shield wall formation where uh, Romans would lock shields to the front and then the uh, the uh, ranks behind them would then raise their shields as a ceiling in order to protect them against incoming arrows or javelins or whatnot. So it's, it's, it's kind of like this Roman take on a shield wall formation where they would cover themselves completely in uh, their shields uh, sort of like um, sort of like a big uh, hedgehog of shields basically or like a tortoise or like a turtle so um, they would kind of withdraw into that and uh, of course because the only only reason we're even having this conversation about romans in china because there's a description of a battle where it was mentioned this this token infantry force were yeah. uh, been deployed in what's called the the fish scale formation but the yeah. fish scale formation must be, mean testudo right <laughs> no <laughs> no uh, the thing is this is a uh, a supposition uh, is made with the premise that only the martial culture of the romans knew how to fight in formation and how to sort of lock shields this is a claim that is uh, impossible to quantify and it's it's kind of like grasping at straws when you think about it and it's actually a display of ignorance in regards to the previous military history of the region now presume just for a moment that some romans managed to flee from captivity because somehow we have an hour to fill out right uh, now why would they end up in uh, Chongnu or Hongnu uh, service, or more specifically, Kangju service. I mean, even the hypothesis that the fugitives would turn into mercenaries kind of defies logic. It, it's, it's, it's a little bit lazy when you think about it. Besides, the reigning mode of warfare for enlisted mercenaries had for some time been right typical for the region. And that would be warfare on horseback. I mean, in a region like Central or Inner Asia, if, if you can't fight accordingly, you're just not going to last for very long, nor are your services going to be all that valuable. Now, this hypothesis has been largely rejected by serious scholars, but it has in recent times seen a renewed incarnation. Um, I'm just going to put it out there. Greek hoplites from the kingdom of Fergana, or that which the Chinese would call Taiwan. Uh, probably uh, I'm mangling up the pronunciation of that as well. So feel free to correct me. Um, it's actually pretty good. Taiwan. Oh, oh, yeah. oh fan fantastic. <laughs> Even this broken clock is right every once a blue moon. <laughs> I, I mean, actually, the Chinese name Da Yuan again, it's a it's a transliteration into Chinese of a foreign sounding name. And there I seen uh, uh, I see hypothesis that's actually um, uh, because it's refer is the Chinese rendering of Ionians, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. Because because yeah. a lot of, uh, uh, you know, in uh, Greeks, because the, the, the most East. 
Greeks are Ionians, and and so mm. a lot of so Greeks yeah. were known as in various places as the uh, uh, Yunnan, right? Uh, yeah, and 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 scholars are guessing that possibly when that been, that's been corrupted into Chinese as Da Yuan because mm. uh, you know when Alexander the Great pushed to the east um, and and he established a. He conquered a series of, of pieces of Central Asia, and he st- established uh, a series of Macedonian colonies in in Central Asia to spread, you know, Hellenism and and so forth. And and one of the furthest uh, city uh, he est- so he established a series of Alexandrias, right, named after mm-hmm. himself, of course. Yeah. And the f- uh, the the furthest um, s- uh, Ale- the, the most east mostest. Uh, Alexandria. I can't pronounce this Greek name, so I need your help yeah. here. Yeah, it's Alexandria the furthest, which would be Alexandria Escate. Uh, and it's actually right outside another similar construction by Cyrus the Great, the Persian conqueror who made uh, his uh, uh, Chiropolis, which would be in, uh, in today's Khojand. Uh, another Greek rendering of this would be uh, Sureskata or Kureskata, uh, which uh, is where the uh, Alexandrian rendering of Alexandria Skata comes, comes from. So you have the Cyrus furthest, and then you have Alexander the furthest, which is basically the same location, largely. Uh, it was probably just another stone's throw away saying, oh, I beat you. But uh, and anyway, uh, I think uh, Taiwan uh, is probably a uh, a Chinese rendering of of Old Persian because in Old Persian, Yauna is the uh, is the term used to describe the Ionians. So it it is it is possible that the uh, the the um, the Chinese orthographic rendering is probably taken from some old Iranic rather than directly from Greek, but of course, I, I don't really have proof of this. Uh, well, that makes most sense because, you know, like the, uh, I mean, because the Iranian speaking people were directly bordering yeah. China. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> so so that, that will make most logical sense. You know, Aksam's Razor says, you know, this is probably how they got the name. Uh, but probably. but there there is a, caveat on this theory of, of kind course. of three Bactrian four supposedly showed up on the mm. door of China, right? I mean Yeah. So a little background on this this quote unquote hypothesis. It was actually penned by Christopher Anthony Matthew of the Australian Catholic University in 2011, if I recall correctly. Uh, and I think I think this actually tells us quite a few things that I'll get into in a moment. Um, there, there, there is a major caveat, as you mentioned. The Chinese sources do not mention Taiwan in the context of this battle because there is literally no need for it. Uh, furthermore, Taiwan is actually quite a bit away from Taraz, where 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 all this is happening. There is, geographically speaking, there is literally a massive chain of mountains in the way. This is the Chatkal mountain range, and this is this is actually a, a huge massif that rises up. You know, this this is proper mountains. There, there's no viable pass uh, connecting uh, the two different locations through a cross section. Uh, a substantial detour would have to be required, and and for what? I mean, Greek infantry circling around a big mountain just to get to some outskirts in the Central Asia, I mean, out in the open vastness? Mm, I don't think so. Not to mention Weishan, the uh, chief city of Taiwan, is under Han Chinese sovereignty and had been since the War of the Heavenly Horses of between 104 and 101 BC. And no specific mention is made of tactics for Taiwan, save for that they had splendid horses. Uh, and Taiwan is rendered from there on into a vassal state. Uh, furthermore, the earliest Greek reference to 
uh, uh, Taraz is, as you mentioned, Talas is recorded first in the 6th century AD by the Byzantine chronicler Menander Protector. So for a long time, this is a uh, terra incognita for many of the cartographers of the ancient era. So there's actually not much reason for there to be so-called Greek uh, mercenary hoplites. And, you know, by the time of the War of the Heavenly Horses, Taiwan or the Fergana Valley had been ruled by Sakas and, and had been ruled by them for decades. And so they were not really oriented around some archaic, early Hellenistic phalanx tactics for its defense requirements. I mean, the collapse of the Greek Bactrian and the Seleucid empires at the hands of the Parthians had proven that this was a largely outmoded type of warfare. And Chinese chroniclers at two decades prior, during more peaceful times, remarked that the warriors of Taiwan chiefly fought on horseback with the bow. So the uh, quote-unquote Western credentials which is to say the modern day LARPing of Englishmen and Americans as ancient Greeks and Romans of meeting the Chinese is, is sort of already rendered moot. We have to oh, sort of man. You mean <laughs> the you mean the Jackie Chan movie, uh, a Dragon <laughs> Blade of 2015? It's it's all a, a, a fiction. Oh yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Carl. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we we sort of have to look at um, alternative reasons for why there is such a fascination of quote unquote Westerners discovering Cathay uh, has sort of lingered on in the collective Western imagination because I think this is where everything is sort of rooted. Now as Taraz itself is uh, is a walled town. It's sort of, um, sorry, uh, Taraz, um, actually. Um, I, did I say Taraz? Yeah, I probably did. As Taraz is, is this walled town, it, it kind of makes sense that infantry would be recruited to its defense, even if only a few of them. So the battle had otherwise been defined and dominated by, by cavalry operations. So we come then to the next uh, to the next thing here. This this town of Lichen. Probably, um, I'm going to be mangling that up as well as well, as well as the, all the other Chinese terms I've enumerated. Actually, uh, you've done pretty good. No, Lichen, Lichen. Yeah, it, yeah. It, the the tones are you know. It's it's a different whole different animal. It's hard for people who are not used for a tonal language like Chinese. But yeah. that's pretty good. Li Chen is uh, is the name. Fantastic. So now the blue moon has uh, has sailed across us two times already. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm really li I'm really li liking this. Yes. Uh, now let's move on with Romans in China. Come on. Uh, <laughs> oh, the the town of Li Chen has somehow become associated with this with this myth. You know, I mean. I've heard all kinds of things. I mean, is, is it this Chinese word for, for Romans? Or as some say, a word for Alexandria? Or as I've heard from some commentators, incredibly, is this a Chinese rendition for the word legion? <laughs> like, 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 legion, legion. <laughs> oh. uh, anyway, this is supposedly where the, uh, the so-called lost Romans would spend the rest of their lives having been captured after this battle of Gigi or Ziza. As we outlined, we, we can sort of safely disregard this. Um, and I mean, to his credit, you know, if, if we go back to this Fergana Taiwan hypothesis, I mean, to his credit, Christopher uh, doesn't really say that this is for absolutely certain. But it also doesn't really help to bring any clarity because ultimately the quote-unquote hypothesis, much like Homer Dubb's original quote-unquote hypothesis, is rooted in some romanticism and make-belief rooted in some fascination with China. It's, it's actually quite amateurish when you think about it. And I think this also 
does something of a disservice to the much more likely and actual candidate, the Kangju themselves. I mean, this was their infantry. I mean, this this was their infantry. I mean, the Kangju, just to briefly describe them, they, they were likely a northern uh, Sogdian people, a, a northeastern Iranian-speaking semi-nomadic culture. This was a people known both for being formidable in warfare and holding numerous cities. So this, this Roman myth is, is actually something of an intrusion against a historical culture that is far more deserving to be looked at. So this wider region had also previously fallen under the authority of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, which had originally founded these uh, cities. Uh, and the, the, uh, as, as we all know, the, uh, the former Persian Empire also had infantry that employed large rectangular shields in formation for protection against arrows. But, you know, it's not quote-unquote interesting because they are not uh, conventionally seen as Western. And I think this is really the heart of the, the problem. Because ah. as, I'm, as I'm sort of detailing this, it, it really must sound strange to want to somehow inject captive Romans into all of this. And it is. I mean, not just simply because it didn't happen, but because the myth hinges upon incredible, incredible quantities of whataboutism. Right? Somehow it's insisted upon, and we see other strange manifestations of this, let's call it what it is, it's kind of an, an obsession with things in the far orient, like so-called, quote-unquote, Celtic mummies in the Italian basin. You've probably seen this, yes. where we see all, see all manner of desiccated bodies preserving stuff like blonde hair. I mean, it doesn't mean anything, you know. Any, anyone who has done any archaeology will tell you that mummified uh, remains will often bleach. I mean, there, there's, al there's always a natural bleaching process of the hair, you know. I mean, we even had... We even had a similar case in Iran with a Persian princess mummy, you know, that was unearthed. You know, it turned out because uh, there had been so many suspicions that this had been a forgery, you know. Uh, eventually, they opened up this sarcophagus and they found that the victim uh, was a recent murder victim. I mean, this, this was someone that they had recently murdered and they did some DNA analysis and some, for some forensics. And the woman... Even though the mummified remains had this, this hyper-bleached hair, even uh, there, there's even video footage as they're opening up the sarcophagus that they remark, oh, she has blonde hair, you know. But th this was very premature because once they made the reconstruction of who the woman was, she was actually quite swarthy, a, a, a black-haired woman, you know. So seeing mummies, you know, with, with blonde hair, that doesn't really mean anything because in archaeological context, there's always a bleaching, this natural bleaching process involved. So, you know, On top of I that, think... We actually have yeah. the ancient DNA from the Tarim mummies nowadays, since 2000. Yeah. And as a result, we know that they, they're actually a mixed population. I mean, they, yeah. they, they were um, like the Indo-European, especially Indo-Iranian, population yeah. from Central Asia have been, pen you know, we even know from historical documentation from the Chinese history text that Indo-Iranian people like the Sakas have been active in the region since, you know, since in historical times. And yeah. and the, the, the DNA also reveals that the, you know, the, 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 the people who live there, you know, they have... Um, like a it's a it's a mixed population in terms that yeah. they their DNA is a combination of East and West. And, and when I say West, I don't mean like you know Germany or France. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, mean, I think that's really important to point out because yeah. there 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 is also a West in the Chinese perspective, you know. And exactly. I think yeah, I think I think all too often we we uh, let ourselves be dictated by the uh, the orthography of the uh, anglosphere that there is a west and there is an east and i think very often we, we don't need to shackle ourselves to that um and, but and, 
Yeah. And and the point is that these uh, these nomads, these these uh, you know. Uh, Indo-European or Indo-Iranian nomads, they have been mm. active in steppes of Central Asia, you know, for long time, for, for thousands of years since Bronze Age. You know, there was yeah. the expansion of them out of, you know, out of this, out of this uh, Central Asian steppes and, 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 and going every direction. And some of them ended up in, uh, in you know, in the Tarim Basin, in, in what's today Northwest China. I mean, we 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 actually know this both for from archaeo- archaeological, genetic, and hist- historical textual evidences. But it just sounds so much better in media and like to just sensationalize as saying, mm. oh my God, they have uh, they have uh, 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 they have fabric that we, that's similar to cultic. Uh, uh, yeah. A place, or 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 they're they're somehow European in appearance, quote unquote European, right? Yeah. In fact, these are, uh, you know, almost indigenous uh, people to this region. You know, at least in Indeed. The last few thousand years, you know, they Indeed. just they didn't they, they never traveled to from say no. forests of Germany to 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 yeah. to, to, to the tar, sand of Tarim Basin. These people probably never been to you know parts of Europe. <laughs> they no. have always and lived I, on Eurasian step all their lives. I mean we still have the descendants of these people. I mean there are for instance the uh the uh ta- Tajiks of China, yes. you know so yes. there 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 are still remnant populations from from for instance the kingdom of Khotan you know but before the yes. Turkic uh, invasions and so forth so this is actually a region that has seen such such a miasma of different eastern Iranian uh, cultures so it's 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 actually such an unwarranted intrusion to inject the Romans into it all I just want to really set the record straight and say that there are some real cultures that have been completely overlooked and really deserve a not just a, a second look because there's no first look to begin with, but they deserve a a, a thorough and uh, and and a real first look at because they they are at the center of this because this this battle this this whole backdrop the Kangju and the Hongwu and the um, and the Han Chinese in, in this part of the world. It's really such an interesting location. And for it to somehow be muddled together with, no doubt, another really interesting but completely unrelated event in, in the Western end of the Iranian world, you know, it's such a disservice, you know, to sort of muddle it together with it just because they want to sort of inject the Romans everywhere into the map. Yes. So, yes. I mean, you know, how I also, you know, have uh, British and American actors such as, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Cusack and Adrian Brody. Oh, my to God. Bring you guys Jackie could have Brody. done so much better. John Cusack, <laughs> my God. For all these has-beens. <laughs> Dragon Blade, go check it out. Oh. I, I it's yeah. not a recommendation. I, I actually just... might. I actually might do it just because I, I have the rest of my Sunday to fill out. Yeah, you know, corona, corona times, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, I think I know the reason for, for all these intrusions, you know. I mean, there there is this um, there is this unwarranted Marco Polo-esque fascination that, that sort of that sort of makes for the underpinnings of this. I mean, this is this is why there has been a big deal made out of nothing, you know. But the truth is, just to really recalibrate what's what's important in this, the Parthians, the Parthians were really the stars of this whole event, not so much of this tangential event in uh, in Taraz, you know, but but they they really hold a much more real credit in having visited Rome, India, and China, and keeping contacts with all three of these major cultures, you know, and this was a people who were well acquainted with Greek culture, and in fact, uh, the mainstay of Parthian coinage is, I mean, they were, they were actually minted in Greek, so what the heck is going on, you know? Why do we have this, this scholar trying to hypothesize Greek hoplites in 36 BC, you know, 
why do we have Roman legions? I mean, we, we have the Parthians right there, you know, right there in the middle of, of all of this. You know, even one of Homer Dubs, I shouldn't really call him an, an, an accomplice because he's actually a really a respected researcher. But in this case, he's actually an accomplice in this proliferation of the myth of the lost, of the lost Romans of China, uh, William Tarn. William Tarn lamented that the Parthians ought to have been seen as an integral part of Western history. Now, this can be discussed on other terms, but the gist is that there has been a terrible tendency to treat the Parthian Empire as non-present in this largely fantastical fascination with uh, Sino-Roman interactions, when in fact, they were at the center of the actual attempts at interactions that did take place. So really, talk about not being able to see the forest because of all the trees in the way. So this state and, of affairs... And to add to that, when, you know, from the Chinese perspective, because there's plenty of documentation in, you know, yeah. in, in China talking about you know the so-called western region which for china was basically everything west of gansu you know everything west of yeah. the the yumen the, the jade gate the yumen yumen gate is the, yeah. the whole kind of nebulous western region you know like all this this rest western region was as we mentioned populated by you know various iranian speaking people and 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 those people and their culture to to the Chinese, they were the West, right? Sure. They were not talking about the Chinese. Were not talking about the Romans. <laughs> no, of course not. I mean, the Romans existed uh, as 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 a figment, you know, of yes. the Chinese imagination, you know. But this is a completely different conversation for a different time, I suppose, because there is just so much to deal with there. I think actually. When it, when it really comes down to it, the Chinese had something more substantive to say of the Romans and the far horizon due to their Parthian contacts, yes. uh, rather than what the Romans thought of the Chinese. Because, as you know, the, the Romans, they, they kind of use this mixed terminology to sort of fuzzily refer to the Chinese. You know, one is they, they refer to them as Serikans, you know, which... In cartography is kind of confusing because that would be in those western regions of the Chinese perspective rather. And then of course you have another Greek term from the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea known as Thenai, which we don't really know where to exactly place it, you know, but it's probably a term that they got from the uh, Persians who, uh, who popularized uh, the uh, the term for China itself to the wider West, so to speak, as we would say, Qin, in the uh, Middle uh, Middle Iranian languages. Yes, uh, interestingly, yeah. uh, you know, China is aware, even in the Han Dynasty time, was aware of the existence of the Roman Empire, and, and most interestingly, that the name they give for the Roman Empire is Da Qin, and mm. and Qin is. Um, I, I, there was many, I mean, there are theories about why this, this name, this Chinese name was given to, to Roman empire, but, um, I haven't seen any satisfactory, uh, answers because no. Qin, um, you know, the, in Chinese you just render as great Qin uh, and Qin mm -hmm. is, uh, of course a dynasty before the Han dynasty. Yeah. Um, and, uh. But in Chinese, the Roman Empire is literally called Da Qin. And in fact, in the mm -hmm. year 97, uh, a Chinese general, Ban Cao, who, had, uh, who was sent to conquer the Western region um, you know, mm -hmm. from his base in Kashgar, he sent mm -hmm. the envoy, Gan Yin, to, to reach out to try to reach the Roman Empire because he, he heard about the existence of a Roman Empire. Uh, from the, the party and from the from the various mm. Iranian people in between, and would the Ganyin actually reach a great body of water? So there's still debate on whether that was yeah. Persian Gulf or, or the Black Sea. But um, according to the to the Chinese uh, the historical document is that the um, 
the 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 the, the Parthian merchants who were kind of who were like very important middlemen in charge of the the, the trade that's that was funneling between I mean, funneling silk from China to Rome. They they uh, told Ganyin basically, oh, it's very very perilous journey. You know, you, you, mm. you like. Ninety percent chance you're gonna die. So, yeah. so Ganyin <laughs> took that advice and turned back, and and that was kind of like the end of Sino-Roman mm-hmm. attempted Sino-Roman contact. But yeah. so what the story tells us is that you know there have you know the, the Parthia being the power in the middle has al- always been aware of both you know the Rome and China, and they have been carrying on inter playing as. The middleman, and and they they also are quite you know familiar with both sides, right? But you know, we're, yeah. we're I think the, the for the for the modern Westerners, especially the Euro Americans, it's it's they kind of wanted to inject themselves into the story. Uh, yeah, they want to be at the center of the attention, even <laughs> though a literal map will say that's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, uh, I think you 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 are you you had it pretty you had something there when you said about you know what they really want is the Brits and the Americans LARPing as Romans. Yeah. I mean, it really is what 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 it is. You know, I mean, they can they can come up with with any sort of excuse as to if it really is about that or if there's a genuine fascination behind it. You know, but the truth is, I mean. They they had taken place now in in what largely was the Iranian world, and what I mean by that is everything west of the Indus River, a good chunk of uh, the cent- the Central Asia, up until the Euphrates and the Caucasus, and that's that's not that's not a small tract of land. That's bigger than all of modern day Europe put together. You know, so it really helps to put things into perspective and say that there is this big colossus, you know, in the middle of, of this, you know, a part of which, of course, a good chunk of it would be the Parthian Empire. And then, of course, you have other states, you know, occupying this this big tract of land. But just to really put put things into that perspective, that the, 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 this distance between the easternmost point of the Roman Empire and the Chinese empire at the most westernmost point, that's still an enormous tract of land. And I still think people don't really quite comprehend just what kind of distances we're talking about. Now, uh, on the small tangents that we were off on there about the attempts of the Chinese to reach out to the Romans, I am personally of the persuasion that the Persian Gulf was uh, was referred to here because it would sort of make sense that the calculated time for sailing uh, from the Persian Gulf and to somehow reach the Mediterranean would would be uh, would be uh, more reasonable. I mean, at that point from the Persian Gulf, it would make sense that the that this journey would be really long. But I've also seen that this was. Um, by, by some commentators, that this was an attempt of the Parthians because they sort of sensed the danger that, oh no, they're going to try to reach out to the Romans, you know. But when you really think about it, you know, uh, it makes sense that if, if the, you know, the Chinese uh, ambassador had come to the Persian Gulf, then of course the information that the Parthian uh, authorities gave back to uh, the Chinese uh, ambassador it, it sort of makes sense at that point, you know, because they, they must have thought that, oh, okay, he wants to take a ship and, and sail it somehow to the Romans. This is kind of a little bit of, of a strange request to make, you know, from that perspective, because the Persian Gulf is, is not really a natural uh, gateway to the Mediterranean. Rather, it is a gateway to the Indian Ocean as a whole. Yes. You know? yes. So just to really put that aside. I, I, you know? And I also want to jump uh, to the point about Li Qing. So one of the, you know, another supposedly evidence of Li Qing being this kind of colony of Roman captives um, mm-hmm. is that, you know, the modern people living in Li Qing, they don't look typically as what you think of East Asians, right? Because some of these people have 
uh, very striking uh, appearances, like green yeah. eyes, um, ex or like fair skin, or or or, yeah. or lighter hair. But so they actually met, you know, like because they really want to <laughs> establish the Roman link. They perform DNA test on the modern population of Lichin, yeah. and what they found out, surprise, surprise. They do not have Italian DNAs. <laughs> <laughs> not a single drop of it, you know, quote unquote. Yes. But and the thing, I'm, I'm, I mean, the thing is, it doesn't surprise uh, those of us who have actually done some, some more in-depth ethno, ethnography, you know, the, the research of, of the people who live in this region, you know. I mean, if you look at Kazakhs, for instance, you see a lot of Kazakhs who, who still retain sort of East Asian uh, features, you know, but they can still have fair skin or have ev even blonde hair, you know, yeah. blue eyes and the like of it. But they, they, they don't look European, you know. I mean, it's, I mean, you, you can tell from, from a distance and up close, you know, these, these people are not really European in the uh, conventional sense. These are, these are still very much, if I can use a somewhat offensive term, oriental, you know, you can see <laughs> it from, from quite a distance away, you know. And, and these people have been living in that region, you know, for yeah. millennium. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, I mean, they're they're an isolated po population, you know. So it kind of makes sense that they would they would be looking unique, you know. They they would have have their own sort of aesthetic, you know. They 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 would look a certain way, you know. But but to to make it out in, into like. They are they have long long gone descendants of the Romans. Everyone knew that this was this was just a, a marketing stunt, you know, just to get yes. some tourists, you know. Yes, yes. I suppose uh, that's 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 all you know allowed and everything, you know. <laughs> yes, I mean, like, because people, I mean, you know, if people. I mean, it's, it's, for me, because I I know I read the Chinese historic historical documents, I know. On the west, the, the the western borders of Chinese empires, there have always been these people, you know, the the Iranian speaking people, um, sometimes Iranian speaking nomads or or oasis dwellers, yeah. who who are physically, you know, different, and 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 these these po populations have been ming intermingling and intermixing for thousands of years. So it's too is I didn't find it surprising that they will find these phenotypes in, in yeah. this region. I mean, I mean, in fact, that, that you would expect it, uh, but, but I would not expect an immediate jump to say, you know, uh, a, a Roman <laughs> legion connection. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's that, but that's and, how you get, I guess, how, how people in the archaeology field and, and the history field, they try to like, Dress history as sexy, you know how to how to do mass popular history to 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 yeah dress, a marketing scheme. Yeah, yeah. Um, I personally don't like it so much because it's it's kind of intrusive, as I mentioned before. And there is also a political component that I yes. really don't want to get into that that much, you know. But it kind of reflects a little bit of modern day Iranophobia that they sort of want to ignore the fact that there has been this vibrant miasma of different. Iranian-speaking uh, tribes, civilizations, and the likes of it, you know. So I think I think we're we're also kind of seeing a little bit of this soft uh, redaction that they sort of want to ignore this this huge tract of land, you know, and just yes. make up their own belief about it. So uh, just to summarize this this whole uh, tangential battle of Jiji, or rather the misframing of it. Uh, I think it can be safely ignored from the events of uh, the Battle of Karai. And I think we can single it out as the product of some academic imagination that, that may have at some point originated in a genuine inquiry on the whereabouts of the Roman captives in the Parthian Empire, because that's a fascinating topic in and of itself, you know. But I think they were just looking for them at the wrong place. I mean, this fascination is deceptive. Uh, you know, apropos the context of the Battle of Karai, the real action at this time is in West Asia proper. And by that, I mean in the Levant, the Caucasus, and Asia Minor. And that's really where we ought to be looking. And in fact, just to open up a new chapter into this matter, 
if we overlook this modern intrusion of lost legions in China, the Romans themselves had a much, much more different view of this, this whole matter. In fact, their view is that it was much closer to home. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's bullshit too, but it's on the much more plausible side. You know, the Roman poet uh, Horace uh, dedicated a, a few stanzas speculating that the Roman prisoners completely integrated into the Parthian society. Now, that's brief, but it's also quite realistic in outlook when we compare to other authors, like, for instance, Florus. Now, when we read Florus' uh, remarks on a Roman prisoner in Parthian employ, he sort of appears like this fictional, ghost-like savior defecting back to the Romans, warning them of uh, imminent peril during Marcus Antonius' campaign in Parthian Atropatene, or uh, in modern-day uh, province of Azerbaijan in Iran. Uh, and we're, we're only reading a literary trope, like this, this vehicle, like this apparition warning of a great ominous omen, much like the various signs of the gods' displeasure with Crassus' campaign, including this slurring salesman of figs at the harbor, or Crassus accidentally wearing a black cape, this being an, an being a dire omen for something, or the collapse at, uh, of, of this bridge at uh, Zoikma um, during uh, a stormy fording of the Euphrates River. I mean, it's amusing, but it's also fictional. You know? I mean, there, there's also a caveat to all this, because Flora's account is, is, is marred by, by several implausibilities, and the retelling is also not contemporary to the event. So it suffers from the same problem as um, Cassius Dio. And regarding uh, Cassius Dio's account, which we previously dismissed as the inferior version uh, of the retelling of the Battle of Cari compared to that of Plutarch, uh, in fact, when we really, when we really read uh, the account of Cassius Dio, it is actually his account of the fate of the Roman prisoners that proved to be the original catalyst for the lost legion myth. And this is because uh, Cassius Dio, in a passing remark, mentions how the Parthians rounded up all the Romans in captivity to be sent back to Rome as part of the peace settlement of Octavian. Uh, and apparently some of these prisoners could not be found. And it's because of, of this uh, passing remark that some Roman prisoners could not be found to be returned, but gave rise to this frenzy of finding these lost Romans. Unfortunately, just as with Flora's account, it is also a much later retelling. So it's not, it's, it's actually not contemporary or not derived from a source that is sort of contemporary to the events of Kara. Now, with this sort of side chapter, you know, uh, of this, these lost Roman legions, actually this gigantic non sequitur in 36 BC in some remote corner in Central Asia, now that we have actually dealt with it, you know, I think it's also a, a good opportunity to go back to 52 BC, back to where it all began, you know, in Parthian Mesopotamia and in Roman Syria, you know, the Battle of Cara, you know, and, and the Serenus Triumph had put an end to a Parthian civil war and to Crassus' enterprise. And, but as I mentioned uh, earlier on, hostilities would go on until 20 BC when Fratus IV and Octavian had entered the uh, peace settlement that I had mentioned earlier. And when you think about it, that's an additional 32 years of warfare between the two empires. And the role that the Battle of Karai had is actually quite defining and monumental in, in world history. Uh, I still think we, we have not quite appreciated the true importance and, 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 and its status in, in history. And I think this also sort of primes us for the continuation of the Roman Parthian War and the Parthian invasion of Roman Syria in 51 BC, 
you know, after the 18 months of dithering and, and stalling and all the feet dragging, the end of the Roman menace under Crassus ushers the era of a Parthian counteroffensive. With it, though nobody could have known it at the time, this uh, conflict would continue on for um, the coming 721 years. So just to really summarize this as a whole on just where to place the lost Roman legions in, in uh, China on uh, the proverbial bullshit meter, I think it uh, ranks uh, somewhere around the uh, space traveling Anunnaki and the Bosnian pyramids. You know, I mean, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of fun to think about, but it's quite ridiculous on paper. I mean, it doesn't really amount to anything. It just wastes everybody's time. I think we should actually spend that time talking about the Parthian invasion of Roman Syria in 51 BC. Or what do you say, Carl? Yes, let's do it. Uh, and uh, to speaking of which, um, we actually should talk, also talk about an uh, event that happened even earlier to the, Alexander the Great's campaign in the East, but from a Iranian perspective. I'm all up for it. That, that is long overdue. So now we have two projects uh, ahead of us. You know, we, we can finish this as a could, uh, epilogue to an epilogue um, to talk about the, the, the Parthian counter, um, counter offensive. I think you just said yeah. a great uh, segue into that. And, um, and after that, I... I'm expecting, I'm expecting a full-on narrative of Alexander the Great, but from the, from the Persian perspective. Fantastic. Oh, great. We're going to be doing this for the next 10 years then. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's no, there's no hurry. There's, you know, who knows, you know, how hey, long the COVID will, will be. We're in. not having a hurry, you know. I mean, it's, it's been such a time between these episodes, you know, so... I'm just guessing that it might actually take a decade before we actually get somewhere. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. COVID has changed everything. It, it, it speeds up the time the space continues. Let's hope for it. We, we, yeah, yes. we, we can always hope for it. But yes. uh, in, in regards to uh, the campaigns of Alexander the Macedonian, um, uh, in, in regards to it, of course, uh, the most fascinating part of it to me has always been the Battle of Granicus. You know, it has, it has always been sort of treated as the first of his triumphs. But to me, it, it was actually his most decisive triumph, but for a lot of reasons that many, uh, many researchers have probably overlooked or probably have maybe even ignored from the Iranian pr perspective. But I always found that the Battle of Granicus has always been what defined the rest of the campaigns. You know, it kind of, it kind of set the, the tone for the rest of it. And now, exactly that's very for... interesting because, you know, as we all know, it, it, that, uh, that particular battle has been completely overshadowed by the Battle yeah. of Guatemala. Uh, and, 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 and so, so we, I would very much like to listen to your reasons for sure. why you know the, the the prior battle is actually the most decisive uh, yeah. uh, turning point hey we can take a whole we can make a whole series out of this <laughs> fantastic <laughs> yes yes yeah. so thank you very much amir for coming on uh, the podcast again after was what, what is it after two years one year um one and year I <laughs> yeah yeah hopefully next time you will, will not have to wait for a year uh, i'm gonna be i'm gonna be you know pinging you constantly <laughs> on all social by media all channels means, by all to, means Carl. yes so so we gotta get this uh this um, Parthia counter offensive wrapped up, and then so we will move on to uh, the next great campaign. You know, the Alexander the Great in the East, sure. but from the Eastern perspective, <laughs> then, Alexander the Accursed, as we would be calling him. <laughs> yes, yes. Let's talk about yeah. that. Let's. Hey, this Bob, is our I, 
yeah, I completely look forward to it. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It's a pleasure always. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And until next time, bye bye. To subscribe, search in Google the Silk and Steel podcast. The Patreon link should be the second one from the top. Or you can go to patreon.com. In the search box, type in Silk. The Silk and Steel podcast should be the first one in the result. I put in a lot of time and effort to put together this podcast, and I do ask you for your support. For five dollars a month, you will receive premium patron-only episodes like this that details culture, politics, history of China, its surrounding region. And China's relationship with the world. You will also receive pre-released regular episodes before they have been released to the general public, as well as newsletters detailing everything China-related topics. I hope you enjoy the show, and I hope you subscribe. Thank you for listening.